Welcome to this April 13th, Saturday, April 13th, 2024 edition of the Weekly Market Recap. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and uh, I will be your host here for this market uh, Weekly Market Recap for the next, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 minutes. We'll see how quickly we can go through. Got a lot of charts I uh, want to show you. Last week was very interesting, no doubt. Uh, we did have the bank earnings kick off on Friday. Uh, some great reports, but not great reactions. We'll go over some of those charts with you. Also, uh, on Wednesday, we had the March CPI out, and it came in hotter than expected again. Of course, rates went up, stock market went down, and then we had a cooler uh, PPI report that came out the next day on Thursday. Uh, didn't really seem to matter. We saw some selling right through the end of the week. Um, but uh, when you look under the surface, uh, got a couple nuggets of information for you you might want to take a look at. But uh, anyway, we got all that going on. And uh, so let's take a look and see how uh, everything transpired throughout the week. Let me uh, first bring up the Dow Jones chart uh, so that we can start there. You've got uh, the Dow uh, on Friday uh, fell 475 points. So that was down about 1%. But you can see here on the chart over on the far right side here, if I zero in, maybe zoom in a little bit, wasn't a very good week for the Dow. Um, we had closed the previous Friday pretty strong, um, but then we pretty much were at the opening, uh, the high of the week uh, on Monday, and then we saw selling throughout the week. A lot of red-filled candles, that's never good, closing below the opens. So all in all, not a great uh, a week for the Dow. Take a look at the S&P 500. We'll go there next. Um, definitely a down week, but probably not quite as much on a percentage basis. I didn't pull up the weeklies. I guess I could. Um, we'll look at that in a minute. Anyway, uh, S&P 500 bouncing around, a lot of gaps, not really a lot of filled candles one way or the other until Friday. We definitely saw a little bit of, of uh, selling on Friday afternoon. NASDAQ 100, not as much selling. You can see much more flat action for the week. I think we did finish down about a half percent for the week on the NASDAQ 100. But overall, I mean, Thursday, we actually had a really strong day and then it was the gap down on Friday that uh, took us a little bit lower. So not a great week, but not horrible. Actually, we held up fairly well on a relative basis on the NASDAQ 100. S&P 400 mid cap uh, took it on the chin though. You can see selling off and closing just below its 50 day moving average and closing below some recent lows on that uh, 400 in, uh, index. So not a great week there for the mid caps. How about small caps? Pretty much same thing. Coming back down, Closing almost right on the 50-day moving average, just a little bit below. Also just below, oh, wait a minute. Didn't uh, work out. Didn't go to the right chart. Now, here we go. Okay, that looks better. So here is your IWM, which tracks the Russell 2000. Uh, pretty rough week. Again, a lot of gaps, but we did see that selling on Friday, which took us down below the lows of Thursday and Wednesday. Also below the lows that we saw in mid-March. Also breaking a channel that uh, the IWM had been in for the last three months. So some definite negatives uh, from a technical perspective on the IWM. We're gonna talk about that uh, again in just a bit. Um, but moving on, I think I had the transports. Yes, transports in here also failing to hold 15.5, uh, which is where we closed on uh, Thursday or Wednesday of last week. Coming back though uh, to test it and then actually break below it on Friday, not good. It uh, looks like we're set up beginning of the week maybe to test the 15.4 level. And of course, 15.2 was that breakout, that double top breakout that we had back at the beginning of December. Um, we don't want to go back down and lose that level. So 15.2 is a really big level to me on the transports. 15.4, though, is held the last three times that we've been down there. So let's see how that uh, holds those two levels into next week. Um Let's take a look at this. If I view all at stock charts here, if you, you can view all the stocks or uh, indexes, whatever you have on the chart list, I like to use the summary and then we can go in here and pull up one week. So kind of take a look to see how everything was um, trading relative to one another. You can see again, the NASDAQ right there down about almost six tenths of 1%. I said, uh, I thought it was down about a half. So pretty close. Um, S&P down a little bit more than one and a half. The Dow, though, down two and a third percent. So you can see the Dow hit a little bit harder than the other two. Transports, 265. Russell, 2,000, 282, 2.82%. 2 
And then the mid caps dropping most of all down almost 3% on the week. So not great action uh, last week, but got some other charts that, uh, you know, if we look below the surface might give you maybe some reason to pause and think about it a little bit. Um, but that's what I do. I like to dig and I like to, to think a little bit about what's going on under the surface and what that story is that it's telling us. It's all, not all about whether the S&P goes up or down. Yeah, I mean, that's really what drives your portfolio. Um, if the stock market's going up, you have a better chance if you're on the long side. And if the market's going down, you have a worse chance. But if you really want to look to see the sustainability of a move to the upside or downside, you're not really going to see it from that from the chart. You don't need to look at some intermarket relationships. And that's what I want to talk about in just a minute. But let's go ahead and take a look at sectors last week. So technology actually held up well, which is why the NASDAQ 100 performed as well as it did. Uh, moving on to the XLY discretionary, big support here at about 177.50 over the last six weeks or so. That gave way. We did close just a little bit below it on Friday. So I'm looking for a rebound, a quick rebound to try to get back up and reclaim that level. Otherwise, I mean, you can look at a couple of these other support levels. I would say somewhere around the 174 to 176 area is where we're probably looking at the next uh, key reversal. So getting a reversal off of those that area would be, would be a positive. XLC, communication services, mostly sideways consolidating now for about three weeks. Um, so last week we did close on Friday, just below the 20-day moving average. We had not really done that since the beginning of March. We went down just a little bit below the 20 before rebounding. We also did it back in December, very briefly, the beginning of the month. So since November, this is really only the third time that we've had a close down below that 20-day moving average. So that's just worth noting. I, I don't know that that's killing the, the current um, uptrend that the market has been in. But it's one piece of the puzzle that's you know got a little crack in the foundation. XLI, industrials, moving up, breaking below the 50-day, similar to what we saw back in mid-January. Again, do we go down, and, or I think I said 50-day, broke, broke the 20-day. Um, we have not even tested the 50-day, though, since the beginning of November. So that would be the area that I certainly would watch pretty closely. Got some lows coming in here between about 120 and 121. Um, and that 50-day uh, moving average currently sitting at 121.06. So that's clearly going to be the next area of support on the XLI. XLF, financials, rough week. And with uh, the banks kicking off earnings on Friday, I would have thought maybe the financials would have done a little bit better, especially because those earnings came out fairly strong. But that is not what happened. And financials uh, took it on the chin, might have been a Buy on the rumor. I mean, this is a group that's been going up for a while, and banks have really been going up, the large banks. Um, and so they may have had a buy on rumor, sell on news kind of event on uh, Friday, or maybe even leading up to it. But uh, however you want to, you know, uh, describe it, the XLY, or excuse me, XLF financials did not have a very good week. XLP, consumer staples, breaking below, looked like a little bear flag here. Flagpole coming down, sideways action, and broke down. But this is a defensive group, and the defensive groups are looking worse than the aggressive groups. Um, if you look at the XLV, look at the healthcare breaking down. Not looking very good. How about real estate breaking down? Trying to hold on to lows from the last couple of months. We'll see if it can hold there. XLU holding up better than the others. Actually, it has normally loves the month of March. Uh, maybe it's still getting some of that March love. Uh, the second week of uh, April, but we did close back below the 20-day for the first time since back at the end of February. That could lead to some additional selling. There's also a slight negative divergence on the most recent high on the XLU, higher price, slightly lower PPO, and that's rolling over. So I think we're probably going to go down and test that 50 and see if we hold there. <clears throat> energy, big reversal and big volume on energy. Uh, I think that's telling. I think we're going to see money rotate now, probably um, away from energy <clears throat> and maybe materials. But that was a big reversing candle on Friday off of a nice uptrend. Here's your materials already broken below the 20 day. That PPO had been looking weak recently. And you can see that bearish engulfing candle 
from just over a week ago may have been the thing that kind of rolled this chart over. We went back up, tested that high, that high couldn't get through, and now rolling over back below the 20. So it looks like materials are poised to drop. <clears throat> so what I'm seeing is a lot of defensive and neutral sectors looking rather weak and money rotating back into aggressive. Just think about that for a minute. Or is that what you would expect if the stock market was expecting inflation to really be digging in its heels and turning back to the upside? Would you be seeing growth stocks outperforming value, aggressive, outperforming defensive, if we're really worried about inflation? Hmm, I don't think so. So that's the first sign to me that this is nothing more than just a brief sell-off. Um, let's take a look at the QQQ. You've heard me talk about manipulation. You got to see this. So this is over, this was last week. So we know the QQQ went down a half of 1%, almost uh, 0.6, almost six tenths of 1%. But did you know that these last five days, I have broken down the QQQ during the day. So we went, ended up going down on the QQQ from the beginning of the week, which was somewhere around 440. And the end of the week, we finished at about 438 and change. So something, you know, two bucks, two and a quarter is what we were down for the week. Look at what happened during the trading day. This is the net of all five days. So the opening gaps of all five days netted down $4.39. Trading from 9.30 to 10 was roughly flat. The uh, trading from 10 to 11 down another $6. So we're talking about this right here being down more than $10 net through 11 o'clock in the morning. What happened after 11 o'clock? When you see distribution, selling doesn't stop. You see selling all day long. Look at what happened in the from 11 o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon, all last week. Add them all together. We gained $3.48, $3.48 from 11 to two, and we gained $4.54 from two to four. So after dropping more than $10 at the opening bell and in the first hour and a half of trading, the last five hours of trading, we saw the QQQ go up $8. Who's buying? We're worried about inflation, right? First of all, why is the QQQ outperforming if we're really worried about inflation? Think about it. Inflation kills future earnings. It eats up future earnings. So if the earn if future earnings go up because of inflation, you're not really your earnings aren't really going up if they're just being inflated. So valuations during periods of higher inflation and with rates going up, valuations come down and they come crashing down. Do you remember the cyclical bear market of 2022 when the inflation was really starting to soar? That was selling of growth stocks. Growth stocks got killed. You could have had Nvidia at $100 a share. It happened, that's true. Back at the low, $100 a share. Now it's what, 900, 880 something? I don't know where we finished last week, something like that. Growth stocks get killed when the, when the market's worried about inflation. Do you see anything getting killed? I see buying in the afternoon of these NASDAQ 100 stocks. See Apple Thursday and Friday? Big, big move there. I wrote about it, I think on Monday in my Earnings Beats Digest, talking about how it's been manip manipulated. I did this exact same exercise, except since the beginning of the year, taking the first three and a half months into account. Same type of deal. Lots of buying in the afternoon. Apple's been doing this, going straight down this year. One of the worst performers in the market, or at least in the Dow and one of the worst performers in the NASDAQ 100. But they, there's been accumulation throughout this process. I, can, I don't believe it's going down much further, if at all. We may have started to rebound at the end of last week. We'll see. There was also a positive divergence on Apple. So got to see if that plays out 
and goes up through the 50-day moving average. It struggled there uh, yesterday when it got there. Anyhow, I find this to be something you got to you absolutely have to keep in mind. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Equity only put call ratio. I've just pulled this up just to show you that we're sitting right now. Five day moving average is literally sitting right in the middle of neutral, telling us nothing. So I was thinking maybe with the selling, maybe we were going to start getting the reading up here around 0.75 or 8. Right now, it's not telling us that there's a reversal due. So it's just not telling us anything. I like to review this and, and continue to monitor it but it's really not giving us a signal at this point. The long-term 253-day moving average, though, continues, continues to decline. And when you look at history, when this 253-day moving average is on the move lower, check out what the S&P 500 does. Higher, 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 higher. When you're coming out of a really pessimistic, one year reading, that's a one year simple moving average, 253 days is the number of trading days in a year. So the 253 day moving average, I call it kind of like my um, ocean liner uh, kind of signal because it doesn't move. I mean, it, it moves in one direction for a long period of time normally. Doesn't kind of zigzag around or not real volatile. It either goes down or it goes up. When it's going up, fear is rising. Usually the market doesn't do well. When it's coming down, fear is abating. And when fear is abating, stocks go up. Look at it. I mean, I'm not making anything up. Just look at the chart. This goes back to 2007, 17 years. If you want to bet against it, go ahead. I see the market going higher. And I see this continuing to move lower. Now, are we going to do something like we've done here? We were going down. We had a quick little bounce. And then we went down again. And during that bounce, you can see we had some weakness. We ended up kind of even during this period on the S&P. But you could see the volatility really picked up. So we want to watch to see if this starts to turn back up again. But if it stays in this downtrend like these others did for the most part, I see the market continuing to go higher. Um, got other um, charts. I'll, I'll show you one other one here. Um, that's basically the same thing. Here's a chart of the QQQ versus the spider. And the QQQ, you can see money was rotating away from the QQQ and into the S&P 500. Basically, it started in January, but the big drop came from about middle part of February. And this is typical of how the stock market works. Quarters one, two, and three. Almost always, well, I don't like using the word always, um, but over time, since 1950, the second half of those three calendar quarters tends to favor value over growth. So growth does well heading up to earnings um, and through earnings season. And then once most of the earnings are done, which will be the middle part of, you know, middle part of February, middle part of May, middle part of August, and the middle part of November. Um, that's when we normally see things shift back over to value. Um, so we're back in the first quarter, uh, first month of the first quarter, and look at what's happening here in April. Money is rotating back towards growth. Just showed you last week, NASDAQ 100, best performing group, right? Starting, we're seeing it now starting to show up on some of my intermarket uh, charts. So let's talk about inflation. Inflation's a big, 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 big problem. You hear the sarcasm in my voice? Um, listen, I know it's more expensive at the grocery store. I know gas has gone up. I know all these things. Um, but those things get stripped out in the CPI. So the most difficult part of the CPI right now is that we're seeing um, rents uh, stay up. That's been kind of stubborn. And that's the one thing that probably has kept the CPI from dropping even further. Last week, we got the news that the March CPI came in with a rise of four tenths of 1% instead of three tenths of 1%. And when I was doing the live trading room for our members on Wednesday at 10 o'clock, I was asking if anyone knew 
um, what the actual reading was because they round. So 0.3 was the estimate, 0.4 came in at 0.4. Well, <clears throat> one way you can check is on this chart, I use a one month rate of change and there it is. It came in at 0.36%. So it got rounded up to 0.4. I don't know what the estimate was. Was it 0.3? Was it 0.34? I don't know. I know that rounded, it came in at 0.4 and the estimate was 0.3. That's all I know. But 0.36 is pretty darn close to being rounded down. If this had come in at 0.34, had, the numbers would have looked like it was a match, matched estimates. So anyway, just wanted to point that out. If you go over here to the far side of the chart, this is when the monthly reading started to pick up. But do you see kind of a pattern? They've been coming down over time for the last three years. Now, here is the part that might be getting some folks a little nervous because normally these spikes that we've had have been very short-lived and then we come back down, then we have a spike, we come back down, spike, come back down. Here we were a little stubborn beginning of 2023, came back down even lower. And now we've been kind of stubborn going up, you know, in the zero point, I think the lowest readings were around 0.16. And then we've gotten up to close to 0 0.4. That These numbers, if we take the average, is still keeping us down pretty low. Like not in the 2% range, <clears throat> but probably in the threes. I mean, the average of all of these readings right in here was probably below 3.3 3 per month, which would be 3.6 annual, until these last two or three. And they've been slightly higher. So if you get up 0.36 or 0.40, you're somewhere in the fours. I mean, I, we're not talking about runaway inflation here, okay? Being a little stubborn, but the overall trend has been lower. And look at the annual rate. That hasn't stopped going down. In fact, right here, I think maybe we did just bounce back up slightly. Um, 3.80. I think we were at 3.76 last month if I'm not mistaken. So it looks like on the chart, this, that's, this definitely ticked up just a little bit. But the readings that we're going to be getting rid of starting in April will be, I believe, March. I think this right here was April, which was 0.5. If we come up with the next inflation reading at, say, 0.3, we're going to see another 20 basis points drop off 380 down to 360 what if it comes in at two tenths we could be down to 350 making our way toward those twos now one thing because i like to focus on um the cpi which is inflation at the consumer level you may not realize this but if we look at the producer price index the ppi core ppi you can see right here the 12 month rate of change, 2.24%. So there's the spike and we've almost come all the way back down on the PPI. So at the consumer level, it's being a little bit more stubborn, but they're both heading back down and the PPI has already made it down to that 2% level or very close. And you can see the PPI actually has spiked in the past up to four or so. It's just that we haven't seen that translate into high readings in the CPI. So doesn't, it hasn't been passed through from the producers to the consumers. Anyway, inflation in my view, yeah, it's a little stubborn. Yeah, it might keep the Fed from, from cutting rates another month or two, but folks, nothing's really changed. Inflation still continues to come down. We get some readings on inflation over 0.5%. I'm talking about at the core level then we might have something to talk about. We get a couple readings up in that range. 0.36, uh, I don't think that's going to do it. Um, and at this point, most of the Fed, um, including Chief Powell, is still looking to lower rates. It's just a question of when. 10-year Treasury yield, though, on the news on Wednesday, you can see, did take that big push to the upside. The yield soared, so a lot of folks selling bonds, getting out of it. Um, are they selling because the economy's overheating? No. 
Are they selling because inflation could be a problem? Yes. That's why folks are getting out. And the reason I say that is when rates are going up and it's not really due to inflation, it's just the, the economy remains pretty strong. Normally, if that's the case, then we usually see financials do well versus the S&P 500, or at least kind of go along for the ride. When I see financials taking a hit, like we did back in January or even into February, that's when the uh, the CPI report came in hotter than expected in February. Rates went up, and both those occasions, we saw the finance that finance area, the financials, um, taking a hit on a relative basis to the S and P five hundred. But it has started to curl back up. I think we're going to see this start to move back to the upside. I'll be surprised if it keeps going down. I think many of those financials will rebound. Maybe we see a little bit further weakness at the beginning of the week. Can't rule that out, especially with some of the closes we saw. But I don't believe this is going to last. Remember, this 10-year Treasury yield, as I've been mentioning on my shows, a cup, that cup measures to about 465. And we got to about 460. So we might have a little bit further to go. And if we do go higher, probably going to see the market pull back again, maybe one more time. And then I think at that point, we're probably going to see yields come back down and the stock market move back up. That's what I'm looking for. Bank earnings. So here's JP Morgan. Been moving up, up, up. And then earnings came out. Looks like buy on rumor, sell on the news. Um, let me read to you the earnings for um, JP Morgan. Actually, let me... Can pull up a different chart, a different. Uh, I've got an Excel spreadsheet with all the earnings from Friday. Just bear with me for a second here. All right, so JP Morgan posted revenues 41.9 billion, market was expecting 40.9 billion, so a billion more than estimate. And their earnings instead of 418, everybody always says, Oh, gonna be a rough earnings season, gonna be a rough earnings season hear it all the time. Well, every big company that reported on Friday beat estimates. JP Morgan, 463 versus 418. 463 versus 418. 45 cents higher than expected. Wells Fargo, buck 26 versus a buck 10. Um, Citigroup, a buck 58 versus a buck 13. I mean, we're not talking about edging estimates. They're blowing them out of the water. But if we look at the charts, JP Morgan down, uh, Citigroup gapped up, couldn't hold it. <clears throat> Big red candle on heavy volume, finished down. And Wells Fargo had a hollow candle, but still finished down. All of these. But notice AD line strong, AD line strong, AD line strong, all three banks. This, I believe this is going to be a temporary pullback, but you can't just jump in front of the freight train. You need to see that the train's coming to a stop. The selling we need to see is coming to a stop. I suspect what you're going to see this week is maybe morning weakness. And I think you're probably going to see some strong interest in these stocks in the afternoons. That's what I'm going to start looking for. All right. How about gold? Got some gold bugs out there. Some of you really like gold. Well, I've been saying I don't like gold throughout this uptrend, and I still don't like gold. Um, does it rally from time to time? Sure. And it's not like I think gold is going to go down. I just don't think gold is going to outperform the S&P 500. So here's gold. Been going up. Look at that candle. That's an ugly candle, by the way. Got up to 2450 intraday. 2450 the price of an ounce of gold. Came down, finished at 23.74. Big reversal on the heaviest volume of the year. When I see heavy volume and a big reversal, I think 24.50 is going to be your top. I do not think you're going to go back through it. Maybe I'm wrong, but that candle looks bad to me. And what looks even worse to me for gold is the long-term relative strength of gold, which topped in 2011. This top part of the chart is gold relative to the S&P 500. Look at that, down, down, down. 
We get pops from time to time, and that's what we're getting right now. Gold's going up, and it's going up versus the you know versus the S and P, but it's doing it on a very short term basis. Again, look at the long term chart. Where do you think the long term is headed? Well, you can I can tell you that this chart, gold relative to the S and P five hundred, is almost a mirror image of the dollar. When the dollar is going down, gold outperforms. When the dollar is going up, gold falters on a relative basis. Now, the U.S. dollar is turning back up again. And I think it just is stair-stepping up. I think we went up, well, we went up here, sideways consolidated. Went up, sideways consolidated. Went up, sideways consolidating. I think we're going to break and probably go back up and test that high. I don't know if that's coming now. Maybe we hit this high right here, back off of that. But I eventually... Until we go down and either take out 99 to the downside. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that would be the number I would be looking for, 99. If the U.S. dollar index, dollar sign USD, that's the symbol over at stock charts. If that goes below 99, then I think gold has a shot. Um, but if that dollar keeps going higher and we get this breakout and we got that reversing candle on gold, I think I'd be taking my money on gold right now, personally. And it's not sour grapes. I wish I had invested in it, but I did not. And it's the long term. I don't know where it's going to top, but I know I don't want to be in something that is trending down long term versus the S&P 500 because I don't know where these short term little pops are going to end. And I don't want to be in it when it ends. When the music stops, and it may have stopped Friday, I want to be careful. Don't ignore what's going on with the dollar. And yes, gold's going up. Everybody's having a party. Got a big breakout on an absolute basis. Just be careful. When I pull up the dollar, let's just pull up the dollar by itself. Right here. I mean, you can see, um, actually, let's get a shorter term chart here. So look at what just happened last week. The dollar strengthened. Now, here's another thing. When you get inflationary, when you see more inflation and you're worried about inflation, inflation eats away at the dollar. The dollar should not go up if you are worried about inflation. The dollar should go up if you think inflation is under control or getting under control. And this is another signal to me that what we witnessed last week with the market going down is not likely to last. Because again, it's the story that is being told by some of these charts. The dollar going up makes no sense if you're worried about inflation. I, that would be the last thing I would do, would be going into the dollar. Now, some might say, oh, no, no, no. Interest rates are going up. And when interest rates go up, that strengthens the dollar. Not true. Not true. The dollar strengthens when rates go up due to the economic cycle. Rates go, or rates, when rates go up due to inflation, the dollar doesn't go up. The dollar goes down. So be sure you understand that distinction. All right. Uh, next week, we got retail sales coming out. So I thought, okay, let's take a look at the XRT. There are some technicians out there that follow the retail group. I don't really that closely. I mean, yeah, I want to know which groups are leading. And you can see right now, retail's been kind of in this uptrend, which is nice. But this is retail over the last 15 years. And then here's the relative strength of retail over the last 15 years. We had one huge surge right after the pandemic. Other than that, we have been mostly in an environment where, the, where retail underperforms the S&P 500. That's just kind of been the norm. So, and you can see the relative strength we pulled back on an absolute basis and we got an uptrend going, but we still got long-term downtrend on a relative basis. So my point is retails, retailers don't have to outperform the stock market for the market to go up. Right here, we went flat from 2015 to 2020. Relative strength was going down that entire time because the S&P 500 was going up. It didn't need the retailers. So while some look at retail sales report as a really big report, 
I mean, it's a report that you need to kind of, you need to help understand what's going on in the economy. But the actual performance of the stocks, not really that big a deal to the overall market. And I think this chart perfectly illustrates that. Last thing I want to tell you. So we've got um, a lot of earnings coming up. One of the things we do for our members is we put together an upcoming earnings relative strength chart list. And so um, every company that will be reporting earnings this upcoming week, that's over a $1 billion market cap will be on this list. And here they all are. And so you could pull up any, any of them. This is Schwab relative to the investment services group, relative to its peers. Look what it's been doing for the last two and a half months. Going up. Why is it going up? Wall Street likes the company. That's why it's going up. I would expect that we're probably going to have a good report with Schwab. And they do come up um, on Monday morning. So We'll see if we get a good report there and maybe we get a good good report and maybe they're selling. That could happen, right? Um, the other thing you can do with this list though, and I think this is really cool and I don't know if enough members do it, use this, but if you click on the view all and hit summary and then just go down here to say one month, it all the earnings coming up this week, it will list the best relative performers versus their peers over the last month. So you can see you got a real estate stock, got an industrial stock, another real estate, financials, real estate, financials, staples, healthcare, industrials. Where's technology, right? This is just telling you what we already know. That for the last month, month and a half, we've been seeing a lot of rotation into value and more uh, defensive-oriented areas of the market, more dividend payers. Technology doesn't go up all the time. It takes a break. It took a break. And from this, you can see over the last month, the technology group really isn't anywhere to be seen. I mean, here's one uh, Taiwan semiconductor um, that has done pretty decent relative to its semiconductor peers. So you'll want to check that out. That uh, is a report that'll come out on 418. Notice the numbering system here. That's the date, the first no, first three numbers, 418. So that's Thursday. Um, Schwab, 415, that's Monday. So kind of, you know, put a little something there so you can kind of know when the company's going to be reporting. And then if you wanted to go into the individual day, we have an upcoming earnings chart list. So this is, these are all the companies that report either after the market closes on 417 or before the market opens on 418. You get them all on a list. And the reason that this is helpful, I mean, we're just starting earnings season. We'll have some of these in another couple of weeks. Chart list will be 200, 250, 300 companies on one chart list. Going through and trying to look at their charts one at a time is rather daunting. But if you have them all in one chart list like this, you can pull up the summary. And of course, this isn't telling us anything about earnings because this is what happened on Friday. But if you pulled this up at 931 on Thursday morning, you will immediately see which stocks are the best performers and which ones are the worst. You can do percentage change, go find out on Thursday morning, which ones are getting the worst reaction. You can also sort it by scooter rank, which tells you going into earnings, uh, you'll know kind of which ones have been performing really well because those are the ones ha that have high scooter scores. So you got SLG. That was one that I just showed you. Um, FOR was one that was on that list. HRI. These are all stocks that have strong scooter scores because they've been good relative performers over the last uh, month or so. So anyhow, um, this is some great information that you really need to know as uh, as a trader, um, putting all these into chart lists. So we offer that at Earnings Beats to our uh, paying folks. Um, so check it out, 30-day free trial. Um, certainly you could do that. Uh, just go over to earningsbeats.com and uh, hit click that green button or sign up for our EB Digest. Love to have you down here. You can sign up with name, email address, 
no, um, no credit card required. Anyhow, if you enjoyed the video and you like what we do in our approach to the market, please hit that like button and subscribe. Love to have you. Have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.